my name is Hannah and welcome back to my booktube channel. I don't think I'll do that again. That was a bit weird. Is everybody enjoying this weather? I'm actually like, it, it's so warm. It's like spring has finally come and I'm, I'm a bit happy but I'm a bit annoyed at the same time because I get very uncomfortable when I'm warm and this light is not helping the situation. <laughs> So in today's video, I'm going to be doing a February wrap up. I read 12 books. 12 books. I'm shocked. Personally, I'm, 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 I'm proud of myself. I've read so many good books this month and I cannot wait to tell you all about them. Just before we get started, can we just appreciate my new book layout? I do like it, but we'll see how long it takes me to go, nah, I want to change. Something that I forgot to mention in my last video, um, there will be spoilers and um, I tried my best in the last video not to bring up too many spoilers, I can't remember, but um, what I'll do is down below I will put the time slots of each of the books that I read and if you are currently reading or want to read one of the books, um, that I'm going to be talking about, feel free to skip if you don't want me to ruin it for you. I will try my best not to give too much away, but I can't promise anything because I'm a rambler. Sorry. So the first book I read in February, literally finished it on the first day of February, was The Family Upstairs by Lisa Jewell. I actually got this from my book club, Secret Santa. Um, actually, it's quite a good idea that we came up with. We're a small group. Um, and every month we pick a book that we've not read and obviously read it, end of the month, talk about it. But when it comes to Christmas, we'll do a secret Santa with the four of us and we'll actually buy a book for the person that we've got that we've read, but we know they haven't and we think that they'll like. So this is what I got and I loved it. So Throughout the book, you've got three perspectives. <laughs> if you have watched my previous video, I'm not very good when there's different story timelines for different characters. So again, I will try my best to explain what is going on. So just a brief description of the book. It's about a family that have been found dead. Well, there's three bodies that have been found dead in a house. And there's this baby who is completely healthy, well-fed, nappy changed, and looks perfectly fine despite the fact that they think that the bodies have been there for almost a week. So they're a bit confused on why this baby is so healthy. Has somebody been coming in to look after her? We don't know. So it's 25 years later and Libby, who is one of the perspectives of the book, she finds out that she's inherited the house that she was found in when she was a baby. Now she's known that she's adopted and she had a rough idea of what had happened to her when she was younger. But after getting the house, she discovers all these secrets of what happened in that house. The second perspective is Lisa. Now, Lisa is in France and there's some connection with her and Libby. And it doesn't really, you kind of get an idea what's going to happen, but I don't, I don't want to ruin it. You read it. You'll like it. So on the day of Libby's birthday, Lisa actually gets a notification on her phone saying that it's actually the baby's birthday. Now, presumably that means Libby. So she then tries to make the journey from France to the UK to try and search for Libby. The third perspective, it's not explained straight away whose perspective it is, but basically this is more like a flashback of what happened in the, the 80s, early 90s, of what happened in that house leading up to the the bodies being found. You'll later find out that the third perspective is actually Henry, which is Lisa's brother. Now through his perspective, he's obviously talking about what happened in that house. So I'm gonna very quickly describe what happened. Their family are very, very rich. And one day the mother discovers this man and his family and invite them around to their house and she becomes almost obsessed with him because he's got this whole wisdom and you should do this, it's all spiritual. And they then think, oh wow, this is amazing. Let's, let's get on with this. Like, I, I, want, I want in on this. So it's a cult. So this guy has basically taken over the family, made them get rid of all their money because they don't need money. They need to appreciate the little things that they have in life, which is, nothing 
and they barely eat, they are not allowed to leave the house and they're basically prisoners in their own house. So Henry is talking about all the ups and downs, all the dramas that go on throughout the years before Libby is born. There's so many twists and turns in this book, which I love. I love a good page turner. Something would be revealed and you go, oh, wow, that's amazing. And then you go a few chapters later and then something else is revealed. And it just keeps going on and on. And it just makes you want to read more of it. I could not put this down. I absolutely loved it. If you are looking for a good thriller to read, I highly recommend reading this. Five stars, absolutely loved it. I've just bought um, The Invisible Girl, which you actually get a wee short passage in the back of this book. That just came recently and I'm going to be reading that next month and I cannot wait. So the second book I read is an illustrated book and it is called The Boy, The Mole, The Fox and The Horse by Charlie McKessie. It was such a cute book. It's beautifully illustrated. It's just little short passages and I read in half an hour, easy read. This book is perfect for adults and kids. I would actually say it's quite a good way of teaching kids about different friendships. Because even though that they're all friends, they all have different personalities. So the fox, he's not very chatty, but he still wants to hang around with them. And it's almost like they appreciate his friendship, even though he doesn't talk to them. All that matters is that he's there and he obviously enjoys their company. Again, really cute book. I wouldn't say there's much of a storyline to it. It's just nice little passages and it starts off with the boy and then he meets the mole and then he meets the horse and the fox and it just gradually like it'll be, they'll build up to their friendship and then it's all four of them just hanging around, having fun and it's just really cute. Again, I'd give this five stars really cute. How many times am I going to say cute in this video? I will warn you, I will say cute a lot in some of the other books I am going to be talking about, just to warn you. Love the illustrations, very well done, and I love it. The next book I read, which is actually an autobiography, and it is Made in Scotland by Billy Connolly. Now, this book has actually been on my TBR for a while. Actually, I think I bought it as soon as it came out, and I've only just read it now. I do have a bit of a love-hate relationship with autobiographies. I want to buy them because I love the person, but I'm not into reading about their lives, if that makes any sense. As I said, I like a good thriller that's a page turner, whereas this is just more like a description of his life and his upbringing, which I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's good, but it's just not, it, it doesn't ex excite me, but I still, enjoyed it. Does that make sense? I like the way that it started where he talked about his knighthood to a reporter but then the reporter brought up that he came from nothing and he was a bit offended by that because he made a remark saying no I, I came from something. Like yes his upbringing maybe wasn't the best, he was in a poor part of Glasgow um, but he still enjoyed his life. One thing he also wanted to mention in his book that he didn't want it to be a really depressing story about his life. He wanted to bring up the happy memories that he had. Yes, he may have brought up times where he was abused at home or at school, but he kind of mentions it and then forgets about it. It's more like a, yes, this happened to me, doesn't matter because this happened to me and it was hilarious. So throughout the book, he talks about his careers and how he got into comedy and music. And then later on in the book, they bring up the TV show that they made about him called Made in Scotland, same as this book. And it's celebrating his 75th birthday, I think. If you want to watch it, it's on the BBC iPlayer. I remember watching it and I really, really enjoyed it. He also talks about the portraits that local artists made of him, which are stunning. There are three of them and they're on the sides of buildings in Glasgow. I have yet to see these portraits, but they look stunning. So the next time I'm in Glasgow, hopefully soon, now that lockdown is easing off a little bit, I hope to go through some time and check them out because they are beautiful portraits. He's just such a lovely person. I love the humour in it. He's definitely the type of humour that I like. I like the quick-witted, a little bit dark humour 
and I, I, I really enjoyed it. Again, as I said, autobiographies are not my favourite, but he's a comedian, he brings up a lot of jokes and that made me love the book even more. So I would give this four stars. So the next book I read is 10 Minutes and 38 Seconds in the Strange World by Elif Shafak. Just to warn you, this book is a little bit dark, so if you, it does talk about murder and death, so if there's any triggers there, feel free to skip past. So the story is about a woman called Tequila, or Leila as her friends call her, and she lives in Istanbul. Right into the book, she's, she's murdered, she's left in the dumpster somewhere in the back streets of Istanbul. And during the last minutes of her life, her before her brain shuts off, she starts to bring up um, memories from the scents and what she hears around her dead body. So she might smell the spices or the sweetness of the honey that brings back to her childhood of when her mum would invite her female friends around and they would like wax their legs and that was the only luxury thing that they really did in Istanbul back then. It does bring up a lot of how she wasn't accepted when she was growing up. Um, she basically ran away from home and became a prostitute and her family didn't want anything to do with her but throughout the book she does talk about all the friends that she made and even though she doesn't have her family, her friends are her family now. I really like the concept of this book, it's something I've never actually read before and I just thought it was really interesting. Each chapter is each minute and then obviously you've got 10 chapters which is 10 minutes and then the 38 seconds it kind of drops down every like couple of seconds and then eventually that's her gone and there is a little bit afterwards of after she fully passes away but again I don't want to spoil anything. The only criticism that I have is there was a, an unanswered question at the end. Again, I don't want to ruin it for you, but something does get brought up and they never go back to it. And it really, really frustrates me when that happens. And I was just unsatisfied, which was annoying because I would have given this five stars. I really enjoyed it. It was so heartbreaking, but so uplifting at the same time. But when they brought that element into it, I just, it lost a star because of that. I was a little bit unsatisfied with the ending. Um, I felt like it did carry on for too long. I just was kind of like, just get on with it. And I hate it when books do that, where you start off with a good story and you kind of get the story rolling and you're like, oh, this is so good. I love it, I love it, I love it. And then it drops and the last 100 pages, I'm just like, meh. I still really enjoyed the book. I just thought it went on for too long near the end. But apart from that, I really, really like it. And um, yeah. I'd give it four stars. So just to warn you, I may get a headache describing this book, but please bear with me. It's a lot to take in. And that book is I Am Watching You by Teresa Driscoll. My boyfriend actually bought me this book last year and I feel bad I'm only just reading it now because it's such a good storyline. The story is about these two girls, Anna and Sarah, who are on the train to London for a, a girly weekend. But one of the passengers, Ella, catches them talking to these two men and she overhears that they've actually just come out of prison. Now, Ella is obviously concerned about the girl's safety and she thinks maybe I should go phone the police. So she goes to a phone and tries to ring the police, but something stops her. It's like she wants to do it, but then she goes, I'm overthinking it. It's fine. I'll just leave it. And then the next day, Anna is missing. So it's a year later and Anna is still missing and Ella is starting to receive these threatening postcards through the post, basically threatening her life. Now, this is the point where I'm going to get very confused. I might have my notebook in front of me just to make sure that I'm saying the right things. So you know how much I hate different perspectives in books? This has five. I know, it's annoying. So the first perspective is the witness, which is Ella. The second perspective is the father, who is Henry, who's Anna's father. The third perspective is the friend, who is Sarah, who is Anna's best friend, who was on the trip with her when she went missing. The fourth perspective is the private investigator called Matthew, who is hired by Ella to try and help look for Anna and work out who is sending her these threatening postcards. And the fifth perspective 
who doesn't appear a huge amount in the book, but it's still part of the book, and that is the person that is watching you. I know, it was very complicated and it took me a while to process all the different people that were happening in this book. Overall, I liked the concept, but I found that there was a lot of unnecessary storylines in this book. It was almost like the author was trying to bring in too much information that will lead you off to think it's that person, it's that, and you it makes you suspect everybody. Which I do like in a book, but sometimes it goes a bit too far. And there were a few things in this where I thought, wow, that's really bad, it must be that person, but it wasn't, it was somebody else. But then I want to go back and go away, but what this person's done is completely wrong. Why are they not being charged for it? And it's almost like it just disappears, like it never happened. I really hated the ending of this book. It just finished like, like that. You finally get to a conclusion and you go, okay, this is what's happening, it's getting exciting, and then it's done. And then it's like a few months later and it's a bit of a recap of what the situation is now. And it was just annoying. I hate it when books do that. And I want to go, but what happened to this person? What happened to that person? Yeah, they're okay, but what actually happened between that point and the end? It's, ah! Again, one of these frustrating books where I felt like it was a bit of a page turner and I was getting really excited, but that ending, wow. Wow, that was bad. I know it may sound harsh, but it just frustrates me when authors do this, where they get a really good story and they make it really, really exciting and then they just rush the ending and they go, I'm done. I think I would give it three stars, but I kind of want to give it two. I'm honestly so bad at rating books because anything lower than three stars, I feel really guilty about. But please, if anybody has read this book, feel free to leave a comment below of what you thought of it and see if you have the same opinion as I did. But um, again, feel free to give it a read, but you're gonna, you're gonna hate that ending. So the next book I read is The Rules for Vanishing by Katie Alice Marshall. So this is more like a harder young adult book and I loved this. So there's a road that appears in the woods every single year and the ghost of Lucy comes out and lures people in to come and play her game. Becky goes in to look for Lucy and trying to complete this game but then she goes missing and a year later she is still missing. By this point Sarah, Becky's sister, has got to that stage where she wants to go into the woods and try and look for her and Lucy and she brings along eight of her friends to go into the woods with her. Now, these aren't really your typical games that you play in the woods. They're quite dark. So you've got seven gates to go through to complete the games, but there are very challenging things in between the gates, including monsters that'll come after you. So there are rules to the game, and if you stick to these rules, you will get through the gates and leave the woods with your life. But if you break these rules, there may be deadly consequences. I honestly, even though I said I loved it, I had a love-hate relationship with this book. I did find myself a few times having to reread chapters. Now, this is me just being impatient because there was one point, for example, not giving too much away, but there's nine of them in total. So they get through the first gate and then they count who is there and they count eight. And I was confused because I thought, wait, there's nine, but everybody's there, what's going on? So I was rereading it thinking, have I missed something? I'm confused, but I didn't. And I thought, maybe it's a typo by the author. But then it's not until a few chapters later, it's all explained and it's just, ah, oh, it's a bit of a mentally draining book, which I really like. The way it's written is actually really clever because Sarah is actually being interviewed by the police and each chapter is basically video evidence because the kids go into the woods. It's like a Blair Witch Project effect where they've got their video cameras and they're recording what's happening. Um, a written statement by Sarah, photographs that have been found. It's really cleverly written and I really enjoyed it. 
I will say for a very long time, I've been looking for a good horror book that will scare me. I was wanting the Joey effect where he was reading The Shining and wanted to hide the book in the freezer because he was so scared. At one point, I felt like doing that. I've read a few horror books in the past, which I've enjoyed, but they don't really scare me. I don't know. I think it's because when you read a book, there's not much of a jump scare. And that's what gets me. In this, I was on edge the entire time and I was reading it when my boyfriend was playing Phasmophobia which for all you people out there who um, don't know what that is it's a ghost hunting game when I was reading this it was getting really scary and I was getting really close to the book like almost like my nose was touching the pages because I was just wanting to hide and at that point my boyfriend gets killed by a ghost and he screams which then caused me to scream collapse on the floor and curl up in the ball and almost crying so i will honestly say this is the first book that properly scared me okay it wasn't exactly the book that scared me but it properly got me on edge and that little bit just tipped me over and it was hilarious the only thing i will say I'm kind of taking back my words that I said in the previous book. The ending isn't great. Now, it kind of just ends. And because everything is more like interviews and video evidence, there wasn't really a written conclusion. It's more surveillance of what happened after all these events. And it's not really clear. But I liked it. I was kind of visualizing it as a film. And you know these films that just suddenly end? And there's not really a huge conclusion to it. It kind of leaves you guessing what's happened after. This is what I got in the book. So even though it wasn't a satisfying ending, it worked personally. I, I really, really liked it. And even though I put the book down when I finished, I went, what happened? Oh my God. And I would have this whole discussion with my boyfriend being like, it could have been this. It could have been that. What happened? And I don't, sometimes it makes you think maybe there's going to be a second book. I really, I really hope there's not a second book because I, I really like the ending in a weird way. Honestly, I'd give this five stars. I've seen a few mixed reviews online and it's about the three to four star mark. But honestly, five stars. I love this book and I highly recommend this. So the next book I'm going to be talking about is Ready Player One by Ernest Klein. Love, 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 love. This was actually a reread. I read this a couple of years ago and I really enjoyed it. I actually wanted to read it before the film came out. And even though the film and the book are, are different, they're both just amazing. And the reason I wanted to reread this was because I wanted to read Ready Player Two and just to make sure that I had the book storyline um, correct before reading the second book. So this book is in a dystopian future where it's it's not great, the economy's not great, but everybody has these headsets where they can go into this alternative VR world called The Oasis, which was created by James Halliday. Now, James Halliday has actually been dead for a few years and he didn't leave an heir to take over his business. So he has left these Easter eggs hidden around his game. And once you've collected all the Easter eggs, you have won the competition and you become the owner of The Oasis. So the story revolves around a young teenage boy called Wade who doesn't have the best background, his family have died, he has to live with his aunt who hates him so he loves the Oasis because it's a way of escaping from the real world and going into a world where he has friends and can look the way he wants because he's not happy with his body. So one day at school Wade is looking at the riddle that was left by James Halliday to find the first key to the Easter egg and he solves it, finds the destination, finds the key and he becomes the first person on the leaderboard to get to the Easter egg. Now this is going to backfire because there's a rival company that are trying to take over um, the Oasis and they're going to be hunting him down and trying to kill him so him and his friends are making it their mission to find all the keys to the Easter egg before they do. 
I absolutely love this book. I loved it the first time, I loved it the second time, and I loved that they introduced a lot of the 80s retro references. So even though it's based in the future, it's very 80s, and that's why I love it so much. I love the 80s. I love the challenges in the book more than the film. They were both fantastic, but I just love that there's a reference to Monty Python, and all my friends out there will know how much I love Monty Python. People have asked me which is better, the book or the film. Ugh, it's, it's a tough one because I, I love the book, but I like the different take of the film because I feel like there's a lot of references that a lot of people might not understand in the book. So they made it more relatable in the film. So at least you may not have seen something, you know you've heard of it, which I liked. But equally fantastic, fantastic book, a fantastic film, and it's always my go-to film if I can't find anything to watch. That's why I said I've watched it like a hundred times, and I, I love it. Highly recommend this book. Just a brilliant read. I love it. So, as I said, I read Ready Player One because I wanted to read Ready Player Two. I was so disappointed. I didn't actually appreciate that a second book was coming out. I'd seen it a lot online and I had to get my hands on it because as I said, I loved the first book and I thought that the second book was just gonna be as good and it wasn't. So the second book kind of carries on straight away after the first book. They've just won the competition. Oops, spoiler, sorry. So a few weeks after winning the competition, Wade is actually in James Halliday's old office and he finds a box with a headset called the Oni. Now this is almost like an advanced version of the Oasis because in the Oasis you're just um, visualising these things. Whereas the Oni, you can use all five senses and you can also record yourself in real time and upload it to the Oni so that you can actually relive people's lives. This causes uh, quite a big debate because Wade and his two friends absolutely love the idea of this headset but Artemis or Samantha she doesn't like the idea she thinks it's dangerous so they decide to just completely ignore her thinking well you're outnumbered anyway we're going to release this we don't care what you say and I was just a bit Wade this is not like you this is your girlfriend not anymore <laughs> and it was almost like Wade became a villain. It was almost like as soon as he won the competition, he instantly thought, I can do whatever I want. So they released the Oni, and after 7,777,777 sales, that took me a while to get, which will cause a riddle to pop up on your screen, and you have to look for the seven shards to release the siren's soul. Now, the Siren Souls are actually based on Halliday's past. So it's been a while since the Oni has been released and people are starting to find the shards. And at this point, something bad happens. Um, Anorak, who is actually James Halliday's avatar within the Oasis, takes everybody hostage and forces Wade and all of his friends to go look for the seven shards and give them back to him so he can get the siren soul. Now we don't know what the siren soul is yet. Now when I say hostage it's not just Wade and his friends, everybody around the world who has an Oni headset on cannot remove them. Now the danger with the Oni is that if you take on too much of the software that goes on in the Oni your brain kind of melts a little bit and you become disorientated and if, if you've been on it for more than 12 hours your brain kind of starts to shut down and causes heart attacks and strokes. So Wade and his friends are obviously on a time limit of finding all seven shards. <sighs> I hated it. I'm sorry, I really hated it. The concept was good but I just, I didn't like the way that Wade was portrayed in it. He almost became the villain in this. The shards, each challenge went on for too long and the excitement of the book didn't pick up until halfway through the book. And I thought, oh, this is getting exciting. I like this, then drop right down. And I just, I was so close to putting this down because I wasn't enjoying it. And I never put a book down. I made myself read it and I eventually finished it, but oh my goodness, it was such an effort. I think I'm gonna have to give this two stars, and that's being generous. 
I'm just so disappointed. Like the first book was amazing. You made an amazing film. And then, and then this comes out. I, I was gutted. I know a lot of people have the same opinion as me, which is good because I feel like I'm hating this a lot. But all the people that I've spoken to about this book, they felt the exact same thing. And yeah, if you want to read it, go ahead, read it. But you're going to be disappointed. Now, remember earlier in my video, I said I was going to mention cute a lot. This is it. Because I read these three graphic novels by Alice Osman and it is Heartstopper volumes one, two and three. Cute, 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 cute. I have seen this graphic novel all over Bookstagram and I had to get my hands on it. It sounded such a good book and I bought the first book. I read it in an hour and I had to go back online and order the next two volumes because I needed to know what happened. So the story is about these two boys who meet on the first day of a new year at school and it's about Charlie and Nick. Charlie, he, he is openly gay. He never actually properly came out. Somebody outed him at school and then he was badly bullied but now after a year he's kind of become the popular kid at school. Nick he is an athlete, he plays rugby, he's like the the cool guy that everybody thinks, oh, all the girls are swooning after him. So after they sit next to each other in class, they become really good friends. And over the months, they become almost best friends. They're hanging out all the time. Nick invites Charlie to take part in his rugby team. They meet up almost every day or every weekend at each other's houses. And they become really, really close. And Charlie starts fallen for Nick. Now Charlie thinks Nick is straight and all of his friends keep telling them don't fall for him you're gonna get heartbroken when you find out that he's straight. But Nick is starting to question his sexuality. Nick is always like girls but after spending some time with Charlie he becomes so close with him that he's starting to realise maybe I like him more than a friend but he's he's confused, he's not quite sure, he doesn't know if he's straight, he doesn't know if he's gay or bi. So the first three volumes that I read kind of goes through the first year of them knowing each other. So this is more like them crushing on each other and they're not wanting to say anything because Charlie's scared that if he tells Nick that he likes him that he's going to not talk to him and they're going to lose this friendship and Nick doesn't want to say anything to Charlie because he's not quite sure about his sexuality. They are just the cutest couple ever and oh there's so many bits that I just was like oh I'm so excited for them I love them so much again cute cute cute. So the first volume as I said is about them crushing on each other. The second volume is about them kind of starting to date but not fully coming out. They come out to a few people, mainly family. And the third book, they're on this Paris trip with their school and that's when they start to open up a bit more about their relationship. And it didn't really finish on a cliffhanger on the third volume, but it made me really angry I don't have the fourth book. And I know it's coming out soon, and I've seen other people online that have got it before me, and I, I'm, oh, I really want it. And I know it doesn't come out until May, but I am desperate to read it. I would give each book five stars. It's such a cute story. I was just falling in love with the characters and they're just so cute together. So the final book I read in February is Vox by Christina Doucher. This book was actually recommended to me by somebody because I've been wanting to read a bit more fantasy and dystopian future kind of books and they recommended this and I'd seen a lot of other people reading it so I thought I'd give it a go. This book gave me very Handmaid's Tale vibe and I loved The Handmaid's Tale and I was instantly thinking like, oh, this is definitely the book for me. So the story revolves around a woman called Jean and it's been about a year since this new law took place in America where women can't read, they can't write and they can only speak up to a hundred words a day. A day. So they've got these bracelets on that count 
um, how many words they speak a day. And if they go over the 100 words, they get an electric shock through their body as like a punishment. This isn't happening to women, it's also happening to girls. Jean has got a little girl who is about six years old and she is also wearing one of these bracelets. And for a six year old, that must be traumatizing. Now, Jean used to be a doctor before all these rules took place and the president's brother has just been in an accident and they need like the top doctors to team up and help find a cure for his injuries. And they get Jean. Even though she's a woman, they know that she's good. So they make a deal with her where they take her bracelet off and she can go into the lab and experiment and find a cure for the brother. Obviously, because she's got her bracelet off, she's now finding her words again, where she can now speak to her husband and talk about her views on what's happening to the world and can actually finally communicate with other people. Honestly, I was a little bit disappointed in this book. Don't get me wrong, I loved it. I really, really enjoyed it. I would give it four stars. When I read the back of the book, I was expecting her to get her voice back and almost um, rebel against all the politicians and take over the president and trying to assassinate him and whatever, but it, it wasn't really that, which I was really gutted. But yes, there is a little bit of action at the end, but it wasn't the action I was expecting. I was expecting a bit more women taking over the world and breaking all the rules where that didn't really happen. I love the concept of the story. It's a great idea, but it just, it would, it just kind of went on for a bit too long for my liking. I liked the stories in between because obviously they talk about the, what happens to the neighbours and what happens to their son when they do bad things or break the rules. And it was quite a good way of understanding what these rules are and finding out that there are going to be new rules put in place in the future where they might even drop the words to about 50 or maybe even lower. I like that they kind of bring up that they were trying to reintroduce the 50s because they like the idea of the women staying at home, having kids, cooking dinner while the men go off to work. And that was the kind of the rules that they're trying to bring back, but obviously a bit more extreme. I mean, I liked the book. I really enjoyed it. It just wasn't the story I thought it was going to be, but I still give it four stars and I would highly recommend it. So that is it. That is all the books I read in February and I read so much. I was a bit shocked. Okay, some graphic novels, read them in about a day, but still 12 books. I'm not going to promise I'm going to read as many books next month, but you never know. I didn't expect to read 12 books this month and I surprised myself. So we'll see and find out. Now that I finally caught up on myself, I'm hoping to do a bit more fun uh, videos um, in the next coming weeks and I cannot wait to show you what I've got planned. Thank you so much all you lovely people for watching me and I will see you next week. Bye!